This video is a showcase of the kinds of things you can do with linear transformations and their matrices. We are going to cover geometric examples, but also more advanced cases used in group theory, graph theory, and even calculus. Obviously there are many, many more applications, so we are only going to scratch the surface here. At the end, I'm going to ask you to get creative and try to take a fresh look at the shape of the data inside a matrix. Here's a simple rotation around the origin. It's a linear transformation because it keeps straight lines straight and evenly spaced, and it keeps the origin in place. Now, if you have an angle theta, and you want to construct the rotation matrix for that angle, how do you do that? Easy. We can just use the build your own matrix trick that we discovered in the previous video. Remember that the columns of a matrix always give you the transformed basis vectors. The first basis vector gets rotated to this point, so we place its coordinates in the first column. The second basis vector goes to this point, and so we have our second column. And there we are. This is what all 2D rotation matrices look like. There's one for each value of theta. A rotation doesn't change any areas, so it shouldn't surprise you that its determinant is 1. You can see that the classical formula for the determinant turns into this famous trig identity, which does indeed equal 1 for any angle. The inverse of a rotation matrix just rotates over the opposite angle, turning everything back to where it was. If your trigonometry is up to date, you can calculate the product of the rotation and its inverse to convince yourself that it results in the identity matrix. Next, we look at a reflection around the x-axis, which basically just flips the sign of all the y-coordinates. The x-hat basis vector remains unchanged. And y-hat picks up a minus sign in its y-coordinate. So this is what the matrix looks like. You can do something similar around the y-axis or around any line through the origin. With a bit of trigonometry, you can calculate the coordinates of the transformed basis vectors and fill them into your matrix, as always. If you need help with this, check out the Wikipedia page. A reflection does not change any areas, but it does flip the plane over to its other side, so the determinant is negative 1. Here are two important facts about reflections that we encountered when studying group theory, in particular the symmetries of the square. Remember that a reflection is always its own inverse. That's because if you reflect over the same line twice, everything just goes back to where it was. As an exercise, you can verify that when you multiply a reflection matrix with itself, sure enough, you get the identity matrix. So a reflection matrix must always square to 1, or i. The second fact we picked up from the Cayley table is that two reflections always combine to create a rotation. You can also verify this geometrically. If you feel confident, you can multiply two reflections over arbitrary lines, and then use the trig identities for the difference of angles to show that, yes sir, the result is a rotation matrix. It rotates over twice the angle between the reflection lines, which makes perfect sense geometrically. Another really interesting transformation is the projection. When we project all 2D vectors onto this line, you see that the result is one-dimensional. We've lost an entire dimension, and this has super important consequences for the properties of the matrix. First of all, it's obvious that if you project onto a line, and then you project again onto the same line, the second projection doesn't do anything anymore. 
The points were already on the line, and the second projection just keeps them there. This means that the square of a projection matrix is the same as the matrix itself. This matrix equation literally says that projecting twice is the same as projecting once. It's cool to see how the algebraic properties of a matrix correspond to the geometric properties of the transformation. If you want to express this property with an expensive word, you can say that projections are idempotent. Now, when you calculate the determinant of this matrix, you will get zero. That makes sense. The unit square gets squashed into a line segment, which has no area. Now, I already mentioned that when the determinant of a matrix is zero, the matrix doesn't have an inverse. You can't undo a projection. Can you see why this is impossible? Think about the geometry. Along a single projection line, many points get mapped onto a single one. And so we have no way to know which point we originally came from. It could have been any of them. That's why we can't go back. We have permanently lost information about the original positions of the points in the plane. We can never recover that information. This is closely related to the fact that we lose a dimension. Now check out the projection line that goes through the origin. All of the points on this line get mapped to the zero vector. And since it goes through the origin, this line is a one-dimensional subspace of the plane. This space, the set of vectors that are mapped to zero, is called the null space of the matrix. But it's also often called the kernel. And that's a word we already encountered before when talking about group homomorphisms. When you have a morphism between two groups, it sends some of the elements on the left to the neutral element on the right. The set of those elements is called the kernel of the morphism. I showed a few examples of how this kernel is always a subgroup of the group on the left. And now we have a similar situation. The linear transformation maps a bunch of elements to zero. That bunch is called the kernel, and it turns out that it's always a linear subspace. We will see more connections between matrices and group theory in the next video. You can already watch it on Patreon. We would be really grateful for your support. After looking at reflections, rotations and projections, you may think it's time to talk about translations. But we have to be careful. A translation of the plane doesn't leave the origin in place, so it can't be modeled as a linear transformation. Still, here is something really sneaky that we can do. Look at this transformation again, the one that pushes everything over into a parallelogram. Focus on this horizontal line. See how we move all the vectors on that line to the right. It looks like a horizontal translation. So you can fake a one-dimensional translation on this line by using a two-dimensional linear transformation. Here's a link to a video that explains how to do this in general. To model translations as linear transformations, all you have to do is add an extra dimension. Say you store some data in a vector and you want to shuffle the data around. For example, to sort it by size or to cluster similar data together. To pick a specific example, let's say that you want to swap the first and second elements, the third and fourth, and the fifth and sixth. Can you do this with a matrix? What would that matrix look like? Well, even though this has nothing to do with geometry and it's just an operation on abstract data values, you can still just use the same old build your own matrix trick again. Write down the first basis vector. Transform it by shuffling all its coordinates. The result is the first column of our matrix. If you do this for all basis vectors, you get the complete matrix. It's really easy. 
I wanted to make sure you realize that you can use this trick in non-geometric settings as well. The operation of shuffling things around is called a permutation. So the matrix we have constructed is an example of a permutation matrix. They always have lots of zeros and only a single one in each column and row. That's because each column is just a shuffled basis vector, which also has only a single one. Permutation matrices are insanely important because they form a bridge between linear algebra and group theory. You may remember from earlier videos that the elements of a group always behave as permutations. You can see this in the Cayley table, where each row is a permutation of all the elements. Well then, this means that we can give each group element its own permutation matrix. The neutral element, of course, gets the identity matrix, which you can think of as a permutation that leaves everything alone. And because these matrices encode exactly the same permutations as the group elements, every relation between two group elements is also maintained by their corresponding permutation matrices. In other words, we have constructed an isomorphism between the original group and a group of permutation matrices. This is great because it means that we can forget about our original group and just study the group of matrices instead. Every group is essentially a group of matrices. This mapping, this isomorphism, is called a matrix representation of the group. It allows you to study the group by using the many concepts and techniques of linear algebra, which provides mathematicians with many new insights into how the original group works. We will look at many more examples in a later video. Have a look at this graph. It shows that you can walk from A to B, but not directly back from B to A. And once you get stuck in D, you can never leave. We can record this information in a square matrix. It has four rows and four columns, one for each of the nodes in the graph. Then we put a one in the matrix for each of the edges. This one means that you can walk from A to D. And this zero means that you cannot walk from A to C. We can now perform operations on this matrix to extract new information about the graph. When you multiply the matrix with itself, you can see that you can walk from C to D in two steps and from B to A, also in two steps. So while the original matrix tells us where we can go in a single step, its square tells us where we can go in two steps. If we multiply with our matrix yet again, I'm sure you can predict what will happen. The result tells us which paths we can follow of length three. But note that something interesting happens. For the first time, we now have non-zero elements on the diagonal. This one over here means that we can get from A to A in three steps. In other words, there is a three-step loop from A to itself. These loops occur on the diagonal because that's where the row and column number are the same. Or, in other words, where the start and end nodes are the same. And this means that the trace of this matrix tells us exactly how many self loops are hidden in this graph. I already mentioned in the previous video that the trace sometimes gives us information about how the parts of a system interact with themselves. This is a great example. Here's a more advanced example. It involves a bit of calculus. When you take the derivative of a sum of functions, you can just add their individual derivatives. And when you scale a function, you can simply bring the scalar outside of the derivative. Together, these two rules mean that the derivative preserves linear combinations. Hey, that means that it's a linear transformation by definition. But this implies that we should be able to write it as a matrix, provided of course that we pick a basis first. 
As before, we will pick the powers of x as our basis. The derivative of x to the nth power is x to the n minus 1, with an extra factor of n at the front. This means that our matrix looks like this. It has successive natural numbers above the main diagonal. The only catch is that this matrix has infinitely many rows and columns, because we have infinitely many basis functions. If you're skeptical that this really is the derivative operation, let me show you a specific example. Start from this polynomial. Encode it as a vector by putting its coefficients in a tuple, with the constant term at the top, and higher powers deeper down in the column. Then multiply that vector with our matrix. Do you see how the elements in the matrix do exactly the right thing? The only non-zero number on row n sits in column n plus 1, so it picks the n plus 1 coordinate out of the vector. It multiplies that coordinate with exactly the right factor, the exponent of that specific power of x. By being just off the main diagonal, these numbers shift the vector elements up by one place, exactly as the derivative would do. So the shape of the matrix data causes a kind of conveyor belt action on the column vector. The goal of this example is not just to show an application from calculus, but also to change the way you look at a matrix. After a while, you learn to see not only the numbers, but also their overall shape. For example, here is a matrix with a clear structure. Its non-zero data is organized into three diagonal lines. Knowing that the main diagonal contains self-interactions, what do you think the other two diagonals do? What is this matrix trying to tell us? Which kind of system are we looking at here? If you want to think about it for yourself, pause the video right now, or close your eyes. I'm going to show one possible physical application that could produce this kind of matrix. Ready? It's on the screen right now. And it's gone. You can open your eyes again. The point is that the shape of your matrix data tells you something about the real world system that the data is trying to model. Here are a few other examples of matrices with very specific internal structures. Try to imagine some creative setup or experiment or physical object that could produce these. I'm not giving any answers this time. I'm really curious to see what you will come up with. Leave your own serious thoughts and crazy ideas in the comments. And now that we're being fanciful, these are some of the equations we've seen in the video. Projection matrices satisfy the equation p squared equals p. Reflection matrices satisfy r squared equals 1. I'm now going to give you a few other equations that a matrix might satisfy. Can you come up with a geometric interpretation? What kind of linear transformation could be behind each of these equations? Again, share your insights in the comments below. Please remember to subscribe, share this video with your friends, or heck, even with your worst enemies, and give us a thumbs up. And don't forget the useful links in the description in case you want to dig deeper. We are now ready to start making connections between matrices, groups, and the foundations of physics. That's going to happen in the next video, but you can already watch it on Patreon. Our channel can really use your support. Thanks in advance and remember to always keep learning.